Uh, my name's Evan Jacobs, and I'm the stereoscopic supervisor for Marvel Studios. What, can you tell us a little bit about what the stereoscopic supervisor does? What does that mean? Well, the, uh, the Marvel films are produced initially as a 2D film, and then what we do is convert them in post-production into a 3D presentation. So um, we take the 2D movie and turn it into the 3D movie that you see in the theater. What uh, got you started in the 3D world? Uh, I, I, my background is visual effects, and uh, it's actually a surprisingly similar process. Um, a lot of the same tools are used. It's sort of turning the entire movie into a visual effect. Uh, even, movie, even shots that wouldn't have visual effects otherwise become a visual effect when you convert them into 3D. And so we're using all the same tools and the same techniques, really. Um, and uh, when 3D sort of came back into the forefront uh, some years ago, um, I kind of got pulled into that uh, world. And, you know, I was excited by it because 3D is, um, it's a whole sort of additional set of tools for star storytelling, really. And so with these additional storytelling tools, you can, you can, uh, you know, it's like taking a movie f that's black and white and turning it into color or, or uh, any sort of the advances of silent films into sound. This is like, you know, two, we experience the world with two eyes and now you're getting a chance as a viewer to see the movie the way, the way that you would have experienced it in real life. It's pretty, it can be very immersive. Can you talk a little bit about the process of converting from 2D to 3D and what that involves? Yeah, so converting a movie from 2D to 3D, if you haven't had to do it, can seem very strange. But what you basically have to do is, um, with, a, with a single camera, you're recording a viewpoint, but you can't see around the sides. You can't see around the left or the right side of the image. But as you move something forward, you suddenly reveal occluded areas, areas on the left and right that need to get filled in. So uh, depending on the kind of shot that it is, we either have to recreate those uh, bits that have been occluded in some way, or, uh, or we leverage uh, visual effects material. In a case of a movie like this that has a lot of visual effects, we'll get breakdowns of shots. So we'll actually get a separate background from the foreground and essentially use those layers to create um, a stepped layered effect. And then separately from, from the occluded areas, you also have uh, internal volume, right? So uh, when you see a person's face in real life, you have a sense of the curvature of their face. You have their cheeks versus their eyes versus their ears. You know where that stuff is. Um, they're not just a pop-up book. They have actual uh, curvature, and you can perceive that. So we go through uh, a process of adding that volume into the characters as well. So. So you mentioned you started working in 3D if, you know, years, a couple of years ago or some years ago when it started coming back into the fold. Has it changed a lot since then? It has. I mean, it really is interesting as a, as a look, 3D is not a new art form. I mean, it was some of the earliest cinema was using, was experimenting with 3D and, and certainly in the 50s it had a, a, a big resurgence with this sort of gimmicky black and white 3D that was happening at the time. People kind of refer to that as, 3D, and then in the 80s there was another sort of period of 3D where people were suddenly leveraging color and polarizers to be able to separate so you didn't have the red and blue glasses anymore and all that. So every time there's this sort of technological advance um, when we go back to 3D, and this time around uh, the big uh, change was really that now we could make it, uh, we could leverage all the modern computing uh, uh, tools that we have available in making films to really make, and digital projection and everything else, to make it really clean and a much more pleasant viewing experience for the audience. So th this, is not, um, this is not your grandmother's 3D, you know? It's really a, a completely modern take on what 3D is. And if you think back to, I don't know, for most people, Avatar was kind of the, mark, the marking point, although there were some films before that. Avatar was the film that people really look to and they go, oh my God, it reawakened 3D for people. And then you started to see 3D films get released uh, rapidly after that. So uh, what happened, if you go back and look at Avatar and compare it to the films that are being released today, 
Um, it actually was very conservative in its 3D approach. At the time, it's, it, it seemed incredibly immersive and amazing, and it, it's a beautiful film, but, if you, but even Jim Cameron has said that he would take it further today and will on the sequels, because the, mo the, the, the whole art form's evolving rapidly. This for, as storytellers figure out how to use it and what to use it for and what to do with it, they're sort of changing the way they approach it. It's fascinating to watch. So the first film that I did, uh, well, you know, Alice in Wonderland I worked on um, was, uh, a, you know, an awesome 3D experience, but if you look at that movie compared to the movies we're doing today, they're much cleaner, much, uh, much deeper also, so we're much more uh, able to take it much further and sort of increase the 3D effect, and it's, it's a, it, it just continues to evolve as the filmmakers figure out how to use it. Yeah, I mean, certainly as an audience member, having seen the film, it, it feels so much more seamless, you yeah. know, you kind of, and s subtle in a way that just like transports you yeah. into the film. Um, for Doctor Strange, though, is there, um, you know, what what new techniques or innovations, or has there been, you know, anything in particular about Doctor Strange that was, you know, exciting for you? Well, the, Doctor Strange had some interesting challenges that that other. Marvel films and, and the films I did before being at Marvel that I hadn't encountered. Um, one of which was that the visual effect, the underlying visual effects were uh, breaking a lot of, they relied on 2D visual cues to work. So if you think about an M.C. Escher drawing, um, he's playing with perspective in a way that makes you think you're seeing one thing when you're actually seeing something else and that's the magic trick of an M.C. Escher drawing, right? Um, we're doing those, but in 3D in the middle of an action sequence, and we have to do it in a way where 3D doesn't give away the trick. How do we do it? How do we tell that story uh, in 3D without immediately making people aware that there's something sneaky going on in the imagery? So, um, so we tested that quite a bit early on, and we've been working on this movie much longer than we typically do. So um, a lot of times we get involved with the film fairly late, in the post-production process uh, because we're waiting for the movie to kind of get completed before we take it on and start to c the conversion process. On this film, I was on, I went to London and was, was on visiting the set and, and we were looking at previs before they even shot the movie and, and consulting with them early, early, early on to, to try and plan out how this was gonna work because 3D was such a big part of the storytelling of the film. And yet the movie has to work as a 2D movie too. So there's this interesting kind of balance there of like not trying to drive the movie into solving just the 3D solutions, but but how can it work in both worlds? And um, and I think we I think we found that place on this movie. It's, um, but you know, so the the visual tricks are very interesting. There's also um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of big epic moments that needed to be told in a way that where we could build and and so. You know, one of the things we try to do with 3D is not just keep it deep all the time, keep it at 11 all the time, because you sort of audience fatigues after a while. And I compare it to like a musical score that if you think about, it, if you just played it loud constantly, it just becomes all the same. Whereas if you modulate, um, then people really feel those big moments, and they and then you give people a rest, and then you really feel another big moment. And so we were always trying to do that in this movie and try and find those places where we could peak and where the valleys were and that sort of thing. And I, it ended up being, I think, pretty effective. People seem to be uh, enjoying the ride, so. So you just got out of a screening of the film. Yeah. What was it like to see this movie that you've been working on for so long finally on an IMAX screen? Yeah, well, IMAX is my preferred format. I always tell people to see it this way, and in particular, because with this film, we've actually delivered IMAX a bunch of additional material, um, essentially a different aspect ratio or uh, a different format for IMAX. So IMAX is like especially, it's, it's a premium way to see this movie. And I've seen the movie a few times in uh, traditional theaters versus the IMAX theater. And it's more immersive, it's more impactful, and you really feel like you're in the movie. So it's, uh, it's Obviously, the screen is very large, and the presentation is excellent. Um, those are important things, and, and they're great. But the other thing is this additional material. So we have a, a movie that was formatted like this, and then when we, for about half, for about an hour of the movie, for 65 minutes, 
we pop open to a bigger image, so physically get more pixels. So it's actually additional visual effects material, it's additional uh, characters' faces and stuff, alternate shots. It's a, it's a special IMAX presentation we put a lot of time and effort into that experience, and it really pays off, I think. I mean, it, I, th I feel like it's, it's the only way to see it. I, I, I wish there were more IMAX screens, because then more people could see it, but it's really an amazing, uh, it's amazing presentation, so we're really proud of it. Um, I know that the post guys here, you know, they take so much pride in wanting to deliver to you guys the, what you intended as filmmakers, you know, for audience members. What does that mean to you, like, you know, that relationship between the filmmakers and IMAX and, you know, what we strive to, to deliver to you guys? Well, it's interesting when we deliver these movies because what we've done, we've had this relationship with IMAX over many years and, and what we've been able to do is develop, um, so with any, any other presentation that you're going to see, so if you go out to any theater, you're going to see conceivably a, a very nice presentation in a very nice theater with leather seats and all that stuff, and that's great. But what they've done at IMAX is they've taken our movie and actually reprocessed it to actually um, reduce the noise, uh, in, increase the sharpness, actually enhance the presentation on a shot-by-shot, artist-driven process. So we, we monitor that process and we work with them on it. So it's not something that's done in a vacuum. We're a part of it, and it's actually an extension of our process. Um, we also do additional color grading here. So it's like taking the movie and just turning it up to 11 is really what we're doing. Um, can you talk about some of the creative process when you guys started first interpreting you know, the original comic book series, the Steve Ditko art, you know, and how did that influence your process in creating the, the stereoscopic effect? Yeah, well, look, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, set of comic books, right? And, and we were really excited to sort of remove the shackles uh, and, and sort of say, there's no rules now, you know, there's no, anything we can do. And so we found this out really when we first started on the very first trailer that we did. We had this shot of four quadrants of a city kind of folding in on themselves and it was a big epic shot and, um, and when we received the shot, it, it just, you know, to talk about the way you would typically do a shot like that for 3D, um, when you're talking about big wide vistas and big landscapes and things like that, what you typically do is you don't put a lot of depth into those shots because, uh, because of the nature of the human uh, perception, uh, you actually would not get a lot of stereo effect out of looking at a horizon. You wouldn't, it actually would be almost flat, right? And so the, the, the sort of the traditional way to do a shot like that would be a very shallow shot actually. And we said, let's just, they're breaking the rules all over the place. Let's see what happens if we just turn it the other way. We just turn it on its head and say, no, what if we went crazy with it and make it much deeper than it should be, uh, should be, right? Because they're breaking rules anyway, right? So who cares? And so we, we went the other way and just turned it up and just stretched it out like crazy. And, uh, and as soon as we did that, we were like, there you go. That's the movie. That's the way we have to do this. And, and so every time we would get a big shot like that, we would just say, like, how do we stretch it? How do we go take it further and really make it a visceral experience for the audience? How do you turn it into something that um, they're not expecting to, their eyeballs to do, their brains aren't expecting to process it? And so not delivering a kind of a, a traditional approach. But, you know, and this is why I say sort of always trying to find ways to use these tools in some new way is like, let's not take the, the way that if you had a 3D camera out on location and you actually had four cities folding, what would it look like? This is what you would get. Instead, we have, because we're doing this as a post process, we can do whatever we want. We're not bound by physics in any way. We can do whatever. Let's go crazy with it and let make it freaky and weird and different. And that's what we did. And it ended up working out really well. I mean, people get chills when the shot comes on. So it's exciting. Uh, that kind of answered my next question, but aside from that, did you have any specific personal goals or goals for your team that you wanted to achieve on this film? It was about taking people on a ride. It's a roller coaster ride kind of movie. I mean, there's definitely these slow builds and then these big, exciting, I mean, the Magical Mystery Tour, as we call it, which is this, this big, epic sort of a trip through the multiverse that Strange makes when he's first learning about the magical world that he actually lives in, it's, he's immersed in it and he's completely taken away by it. And we, were, we wanted to, we had explored 
doing this kind of thing a little bit in Ant-Man with, um, with their microverse. And it was a, a shorter sequence and not as crazy, but we had kind of designed something like that. Um, so it was like, how do we take that but take it to another level? Again, just turn it up even more and really go crazy. And that's what we tried to do. And so um, while still we don't want people, you know, getting nauseous or anything. So it's how do you modulate that? How, where's that line? How do you find it? And, and I'm uh, really happy with that sequence. It's one of the sequences people talk about constantly. It's just it's such a ride. And then, of course, in IMAX, it's an extra uh, top and bottom material, which makes it even more crazy. So it's really fun. Why do you think the character and story of Doctor Strange lends itself to IMAX and to storytelling through that specially formatted uh, aspect ratio? I would say, for me, it's about the canvas, right? This is a big canvas, and IMAX is delivering the biggest canvas that there is out there. So it's an opportunity for us to to tell this big epic story with magic and crazy stuff going on and do it in a way that really does it justice. I mean, yes, you'll see it on a small screen someday on your television or on your iPhone or whatever it is. Someday you're gonna see it that way, but this is the way we intended to see it. Let's, let's put it up big, bigger than you can really take in. For, from a 3D standpoint, that, what does that extra top and bottom allow you to do? Well, it's interesting because what, what happens is that with 3D, you're essentially looking through a window, and that's the way that you have to think about it. It's hard to, if you don't do it every day, it's hard to kind of get your head around it, but basically you're looking through a window, and what's happening outside is the 3D. Um, but with a movie like this, anything that breaks the window, top, bottom, left, right, is gonna mess with the illusion of depth, right? So if you make the window bigger, you suddenly have much more to play with in terms of getting things out into the audience space, or allowing the audience to be deeper in there without this sense of looking through a window. There's something much more visceral about being there and it being sort of surrounding you in all directions. So to me, um, I love that 65 minutes of the movie because it really feels like when it, it's like the shackles are released in a way and you suddenly are just looking out into this uh, infinite space. It's very exciting. Uh, just to digress for a moment, did you get a chance to see the movie um Ghostbusters, the most recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you have a chance to see it in IMAX? Yeah, with the breaking windows. Yeah, yeah. That's a totally different kind of usage, right? It is. I mean, we did that same effect um, a little bit in Guardians of the Galaxy. We did it. We experimented with that as well, um, and it's a lot of fun. The breaking of the windows, where essentially you have a matted movie that's two four zero, but you allow certain objects to go out beyond uh, beyond the mats. And it's great, and it's a really fun effect, and it's unexpected, and the audience gets a kick out of it. The problem with that we've found with our movies, with our content, is that um, if it's not a movie that the tone has to fit, right? So Guardians was a, a movie where when you did those moments, it fit with the tone of the scene. But in a movie like um, Doctor Strange, it would really take you out of the movie. You would become aware of it as a gimmick. So it's, it's very... Uh, important. So you look at a movie like Ghostbusters, it's perfect tone and it's so much fun when it happens, right? When the, you know, something, you know, whatever, a ghost vomits out at you, it's like really fun. But, but you're definitely aware of it. You're, as an audience member, you're like, oh, I'm watching a movie, this is happening. We, we kind of, our goal was really to transport people into their, into this world, so we didn't want to constantly be reminding them that, oh, they're seeing a trick, you know? Uh, in an interview <coughs> with Benedict Cumberbatch uh, of a couple days ago, he was it was so interesting how he described IMAX and like the three D and the visual effects, and he called it like a, a whole other character, yeah. you know, and to help sort of move the story along. How do you think those visual effects and the three D and that IMAX, you know, extra um, expanded aspect ratio helps the story? Well, I think that. <laughs> You know, I've had the luxury of working on the movie long enough to be able to see it before the visual effects were done, see it after the visual effects were done, see it and the 3D was done, and then see it when the IMAX was done. And every t step along the way, you see this m sort of dramatic rise and change in terms of the effectiveness of the storytelling overall. So clearly, I think most people would see very clearly that the visual effects is a critical part of a movie like this without 
all the visual effects, it's sort of hard to get a sense of what's happening. You know, if you just cut to a black card that said this happened, it wouldn't really work. But what's maybe not as obvious to people until they experience it is that the 3D does the same thing. And, and, and what's interesting is that um, we, there are folks in our organization that really focus on the 2D part of the movie. And so they don't get a chance to come and visit and see the 3D that often. And when we finally debuted it, they were just floored which I love, you know what I mean? You want that effect of just like, they think they know the movie. These guys have been working with the movie for a year. They know what it is. And then they go, oh my God, I never saw that thing. I never saw that up here. Oh my God, that's so different than I expected. And it's all there in their imagery. All we're trying to do with the 3D conversion is take the 2D imagery and honor it and make it better in whatever way we can, right? So. Are there any shots or scenes or sequences that were particularly challenging and, and why? Well, we had a few, I mean, there's a few sequences in the movie that were challenging for different reasons. I mean, we definitely, um, Dark Dimension is a tricky one because there's no sense of scale there. I mean, he's, Dormammu is humongous guy and, and how big is he? I don't know. It's hard to even tell. Oh, how far away is he? We, you know, there's no real depth cues to tell you what anything. All the rules are off in the dark dimension, really. So, um, and it turned out great, but it's it was tricky for a while to figure out like just where do we put things? How big? How deep do we go? What do we do there? So that was a fun sequence for us to sort of test with and figure out what to do to make it impactful and and yet still allow the audience not to be. We don't want to distract. You know, we want to support the storytelling of it. So. That was a big one. I, you know, Hong Kong was challenging just from a technical perspective. Everything's going backwards and there's tons of destruction and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And it's a tricky one to, uh, from a technical perspective, to finish it, to make it look good and clean and all that. Um, the, there's a scene at the beginning of the film where, um, where Doctor Strange seeks out this guy Pangborn to figure out how he's healed himself and he meets him in an environment that has um, basically fences everywhere. And it's a non-visual effects sequence, so we got a hold of that sequence fairly early and we were able to start working on it. But to separate Pangborn from his fence, from the fence behind him, from the basketball players behind him, and to get all those layers in there in a way, um, and then repaint all the areas that, are, that are, get broken when we separate them, uh, was just a that was a very challenging sequence to get clean and do, and do right. That was a, a, just a tricky tricky set of shots. It's, it's not even a shot you would really yeah. think. Yeah, it's an invisible, member. right? Yeah. I mean, it. But it's the thing. If you do it wrong, then everybody's like, "What's up with that? Why does that look like that?" So that was a tricky one for us in, as in the invisible category. For you personally, were there any particular like triumphs or scenes or shots that you're especially proud of that you can't wait for people to see? The, the, the one shot that personally I, I was my thing is there's a moment where Strange and Mordo are standing on this building and they, and they just, and then the building flips and they fall off the building into a city that's expanding in this sort of Hitchcock style shot that's the building, the whole city is stretching the skyline. And they're falling, these little guys falling into this, into this uh, abyss below, right? So we, that shot was, was, it's the deepest shot in the movie. It's, it's very, very deep. And, uh, and the guys, uh, you know, sort of initially we had them falling very far. But then as we started to look at it, we were like, no, let's not have them fall very far at all. We'll just have them, they only travel a few, a little bit in, in depth. But the city travels a lot in depth. And so I feel like as an audience member, you're right there with them falling, kind of going like, oh, like this. So I'm always excited when people see that shot, which not very many people have gotten to see it yet, but as the movie rolls out, people will start to experience it. But it wasn't in any of the trailers or anything. And it's just a really fun shot. So I get a kick out of that shot because I watch people's faces when they watch it. And it's definitely one where if you have vertigo, you're going to feel it. Are there any other like moments or shots that are particularly that you're also particularly excited for people to see? I think that or that sh they should look out for. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that there's another one that people always miss, which is really fun. But everybody, it goes by so fast they don't even realize what they're seeing. But there's an M.C. Escher shot where we start looking kind of an aerial view of a, a corner of a uh, of New York City, and Strange and Mordo are running out there, and then the camera starts to shift and as it shifts the whole 
street just folds into this crazy, like one street folds up and the other street folds down and there's all this crazy stuff happening and it comes all the way around and into a close up of him. Lots of stuff going on in that shot. Very, very complicated shot. And yet, hopefully, people don't even realize, they, when you start that shot, you don't realize anything sneaky is going on at all. And by the end of it, you're like, what just happened? So it's, I almost wish it was a longer shot because people don't get, because they just sort of, it goes by and people are like, I don't know what just happened. It's, like, it's <laughs> totally one of those anamorphic <laughs> effects where like, it's all about perspective, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's such a cool shot. I yeah. know exactly the one you're talking about. <laughs> it, I loved that shot. Um, so do you have any advice for people who are trying to get into this world of visual effects and uh, 3D stereoscopic effects and all of that? What would you recommend to them if they were coming into Hollywood and needed some advice? I, you know, it's an interesting industry. It's become a more mature industry than it used to be. So um, there are definitely schools that you can go to now, and it, this wasn't always the case. And so there are places, that are, there are avenues for people to start. But I feel like what, what serves people, and I always tell people, is like a, a, some kind of background in photography is incredibly helpful because having a sense of, it's everything's, Everything we do is a magic act, right? Everything we do is a trick of some kind or another and sort of getting your head around how things photograph and what things look like when you photograph them is incredibly important. If you're interested in 3D, then certainly getting a hold of uh, three, experimenting with 3D cameras is incredibly helpful as well. But that's just the jumping off point, really, because once you get a hold of the tool set that we have to use, then you kind of can break all those rules, which is really fun. So um, I think that you know, it's, there's, there are avenues into the industry now, which is awesome. And so there's always a, there's, there's a ground floor that you can work your way up through and, and all that. But really it's about seeing a lot of movies and, and, and taking pictures whenever you can. So you kind of get used to seeing what things look like when they're photographed is incredibly helpful. So IMAX is coming on 50, their 50 year anniversary. And, you know, in the last couple of decades, we've sort of moved from documentary filmmaking to the Hollywood, you know, narrative films that are coming out. How do you think IMAX has sort of changed the landscape of movie going? 50 years blows my mind, I've got to tell you. I, it's amazing to me. But, I, you know, IMAX has been a staple my whole life, and, and I was always aware of it, you know, in the early days with big, you know, nature photography and all that sort of thing. And, if there's one thing that IMAX has always been known for, it's like an incredibly high quality image and presentation. And, and that's still true today, which is, which is amazing. Um, I think you know, bringing that tool set into a narrative world and allowing filmmakers to use it, and not just telling stories about um, you know, animals and nature or a trip to the moon or whatever, but now saying, here's how you can tell your story on this canvas is, is really, really exciting. And, and it's something that I've really enjoyed being a part of because I feel like when, for me, you know, working in film was always about the theatrical experience. I mean, it's, you're getting to tell a story, a modern storytelling is in a theater with a, a whole bunch of people. And this is, this is a reason to get the sitter and, and, and you know, pay the valet and, and, you know, and go out there and see it because you're really getting an incredible experience. Um, that premium experience is what people want, I think, and, and I love that IMAX is so passionate about the image quality and the presentation and the brightness of their projectors and, and everything else. And so you know that if you're buying an IMAX ticket, that you're going to get a good quality result. You're not going to be sitting there going like, oh man, I, I couldn't see what was going on in the corner over there because the projector was blurry or whatever. That doesn't happen. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan. Do you remember the first IMAX movie you ever saw? Oh my gosh. I, I definitely saw stuff at the Science Center back in the day, the big 140 screen. Um, I don't remember what movie it was, but I remember being blown away. I, I can't remember what it was. It was one of the museum pieces for sure. Um, but yeah, I don't recall which one it was to be honest. But, but obviously it had yeah. an impact. Well, I just was blown away, but I'd never been in a theater like that. I mean, at the time, too, stadium seating and all that stuff, that was all new. I mean, nobody had done that. And to be sitting in a st with a screen that was, like, below the floor and, <laughs> and above the ceiling and, you know, it was, like, incredible. So, I, to me, I, you know, that's a, that's, 
an ex a very different way to see cinema, you know. If you could pick any film ever to remaster into IMAX, what would it be? Hmm. Wow. Wow. I'm kind of I'm kind of guessing you've done some of these, right? Some of the ones that I'm thinking of. Um, I don't know. When you said that, 2001 popped into my head right away. It seems like the kind of movie that needs that deserves that sort of treatment. So it's usually the first one. People yeah. Say. <laughs> and then it's like Apocalypse <laughs> Now. Yeah, that'd be good. And then recently, my favorite one was Alien. God, I loved Alien. Alien would be really cool. Yeah, that would be neat.